if you're focused on seed saving, that might look different than um, being focused on building skills. So there's a lot of different things that we can think about related to our why. Don't see any coming into the chat, but that's okay. Just kind of think about it and we're ready to go to the next slide. Oh, I do see someone, Richard said, why garden? Primarily for food, nothing beats the taste of fresh from the garden. I completely agree. Um, uh, tomatoes from the garden, I mean, everything from the garden tastes better than things that you find at the grocery store. And how rewarding is it that you start with a little tiny seed and then by, you know, midsummer, you're harvesting bountiful baskets full of fresh produce, fresh, colorful produce like we have on the screen now. Um, so the next thing to consider when we're talking about garden planning that I think some people kind of forget about, which I'm always kind of giggle about, like I did this too, like one year I grew a ton of beets and then I realized like no one in my house really likes beets. Why am I growing these? So grow what you eat. Um, so if you, you think about like what is on your normal plate for dinner, what isn't on your plate? Like what do you avoid when you go to a restaurant or what do you never buy at the grocery store? I would recommend not growing those foods because you don't wanna waste your space, your time, your energy. Um, it can end up in your compost bin. It could feed your backyard chickens. You could gift it to a friend, but I really like to say, grow what you eat. And then what's really um, important to also think about is how often do you eat it? So if you eat a, a leafy green salad every day, you have to plant more than one head of lettuce. You actually have to plant lettuce that's staggered. We call it kind of succession planning. So do you plant a couple heads of lettuce every single week, all summer long? So you have a continually available harvest. Do you can produce? Like I'm a, I like to can and preserve food. So I grow a lot of potatoes, tomatoes, um, so that I can can that, but that takes up space and time. So you have to be thoughtful about that. Do you have the storage capacity? Do you have the time and energy in the summertime to be canning produce? Maybe you like to hike and camp and you're barely at home. So you just want to be able to grow some carrots and radishes to bring on your camping trips as a yummy snack. Um, another thing I think myself included that we do is like you plant everything all at once because you want to fill up your garden beds and get everything done. And then you realize like, oh, I just planted 50 heads of broccoli. How am I ever going to eat 50 heads of broccoli in one day? You're probably not unless you're going to do some major preservation um, work that day when you harvest all that broccoli. But thinking about that of saying like, oh, I'm going to plant a couple broccoli plants this week, maybe a couple weeks later, I'll plant a couple more. So I have a couple heads of broccoli spaced out in time. Um, so I think that those are two really important things to consider when we're talking about planning your garden. So uh, like I said, I, I actually, when I was working on my garden plan that I'll show you all in a couple slides, I was like, okay, what are the plants that while in my mind, I want to grow them, but we never eat and it's beets and eggplants. I really don't like eggplants either. And I've grown them in the past. And then I'm like, doing um so those I had a big x next to beets and eggplants and for you that might be like you really don't like cucumbers or you really don't like kale but you love spinach so think about those things also think about like do you drink herbal tea every day do you love to have fresh herbs sprinkled on your eggs or on a on your soup if you drink uh, eat soup and you love fresh parsley Think about those types of things. Um, I, there's also terms like salsa garden or pizza garden where you grow all the things you need to make fresh pico de gallo or a fresh um, pizza sauce. So those are other ways that you can think about planning your garden if those are dishes that you love to enjoy in your house. Go ahead to the next slide for me, Hannah. Thank you. Okay, so this is where we start to really get into like, you know, the plants that you like to eat and how often, what can actually grow here? We can't grow everything in our amazing climate. So how do we think about those types of plants and even the varieties of the plants that we like that will work well here? So a couple of resources I wanted to point out to you um, that are available through our website are a local planting calendar and schedule that actually says, 
okay, now's the time to get out there and plant your kale. Oh, now's the time to transplant your tomatoes. Um, also plants and seed varieties for our growing region. Um, and one, if you like like books, instead of going to online resources, I recommend this book. It's called Rocky Mountain Fruit and Vegetable Gardening. It talks a, a lot about um, different varieties of plants that will do well in our climate. So that's a really great resource. That was one of the first gardening books I bought when I moved here and started my garden. So some things to think about are your zones. So we're primarily in zone five, but as I said in the beginning, if your garden is north of Ketchum, you might have a, a, a four, a, a zone four. If you're south Bellevue, but not necessarily all the way south like I am in Gannett, you might lean towards a six, um, depending on the that microclimate that you're in. Um, but you can kind of use zone five as your basis for that. Um, that's based on what's called USDA hardiness zones. So that's your average annual minimum winter temperature, which is a mouthful, but it's essentially saying, if you were to grow this variety of grapes that doesn't, that isn't cold hardy down to negative 12 degrees, it will die. Um, and you wasted all that money and time trying to grow those grapes. Uh, book Rocky Mountain Fruit and Vegetable Gardening. And it's published by Cool Springs Press. I'll leave it up there for a second for people to write that down. You're welcome, Joel. Um, another thing to think about is days to maturity. So we have a shorter growing season, which means if a plant takes 180 days to go from seed to ripe, it's not going to grow here because it's going to freeze. Um, so how can we think about finding plants that do well, that go from seed to being ripe to eat within under 90 days? Um, you also can consider cool and warm season plantings. So our cool season is spring and fall. Um, that's when we still have cold, colder nights. We still have cool nights all summer long, but really that daytime temperature isn't getting higher than 70-ish or so. And things like leafy greens, carrots, um, turnips, radishes, those even uh, garden peas, those do well in the cooler days. And then your hot summer plants, your warm season plantings like tomatoes, cucumbers, zucchinis, those all are very, very, um, they do not like freezing temperatures. So we plant those after the first week of June usually. And then um, I think, can you skip? Well, no, I'll just get to greenhouses when I get to greenhouses. I wanted to show you all a couple examples of like what seed packet information could look like. So on the next slide, it's a little crazy of a slide, but that's okay. Um, there's just some different, so the first, the, the map there is the cold hardiness zone. So as you can see that kind of line down the valley, um, this is found at the, um, if you just type USDA cold hardiness maps, you can get this. Um, so you can see like in different areas of the valley out in canyons, it actually gets a little warmer on some of those hillsides, right? So we have variable zones, but most of us um, are in that 5A zone. Then uh, next to that, I have a chart I took off Johnny Seeds. And that's basically to show you the different days of maturity in different tomato varieties. So on this chart, you can see that new girl tomatoes, they mature in 62 days. So your likelihood of getting a big crop is a lot higher than the Wisconsin 55, which has 50, 80 days till maturity. So if you're shopping on Johnny's or Baker heirloom seeds, or even at like Adkinson's and their seed racks, you can look for those days to maturity. It's always better to try to go with those shorter days of maturity because you'll have more success with growing that crop and harvesting and enjoying that crop. Um, and then I have a couple seed packets. So my favorite seed producer is Snake River Seed Cooperative. They are, they work with Inner Mountain West growers. So very like thoughtful towards our climate. Um, I buy almost all of my seeds there if I don't get my seeds through our local seed library. 
And as you can see on those seed packets, they give you days to maturity. They also give you planting depth, seed spacing and days to germination. So those are just some things that are guidelines when you're looking at your seed packets um, and thinking about what to plant. And th that information is also on their website. So if you're shopping around for a couple different types of varieties of things, you can look at those days to maturity and choose the shorter um, number of days. I also just wanted to um, put plug for sourcing your seeds and plant starts locally um, because we're in this cold, high desert climate, it's really important to get seeds and plants that are adapted to our growing area. Um, you can do that by sourcing seeds from the Snake River Seed Cooperative. There's another one called Giving Ground Seeds and they're in the Idaho Falls region, which is kind of similar to our climate. The Wood River Seed Library is a free seed source. That's great. It's housed at the Haley Public Library. Um, there are seed and plant exchanges where those seeds are available on uh, April 23rd and May 28th this year. And then if you don't wanna start from seed and you want to buy plant starts, I highly recommend sourcing those plant starts from your local farmers. Squash Blossom Farm does a big plant sale every year. Those are chosen, those, those, the varieties that they sell are chosen for our region because that's what the farmers grow. So we know it's successful because they're growing it and selling it at the farmer's market. Um, farmers also, like they're very thoughtful about the materials used to grow their plants. So they're often uh, very hardy and well-producing plants. I last year barely started anything from seed because I moved to my new home in May and I bought almost all of my plants from Squash Blossom Farm and I had oodles of cherry tomatoes. I never bought a single tomato last season, which was really incredible. Um, versus my own starts, I haven't had that much success and maybe you would get a handful each season. So I definitely think that um, if you wanna go the plant route where you're buying plants and transplanting them into your garden, definitely shop with the local farmer. That's gonna be your best bet for the varieties that do well here in good transplanting. Okay, any questions coming up? I know I'm throwing a lot out yeah, but hopefully it's all informative for you. So the next slide, we're going to talk about, this is where like your resources and preferences come in. So things to consider when planning your garden, is like how much time do you have? slash how much time do you want to spend in your garden? Do you want to be weeding every day or do you wanna go out once a week and check on, in on things and harvest? Um, what's your budget for your garden? Soil can be really expensive. A lot of people build beautiful raised beds and then they realize they're gonna spend $1,000 on soil. It's just things to consider, not telling you to go to one way or another. Just think about that when you're thinking about your garden planning. Um, seeds are really cheap. Plant starts, not so cheap. So you might be able to, for the same price of a seed packet for $4, I'm just going to grab one of my seed packets right here, Easter egg radishes. Okay. There are 200 seeds in this packet that cost me $4. 200 radishes. You're probably not going to find a radish start anywhere because they're so easy to grow from seed but most plant starts are gonna be at least $5 a piece, if not more. So you really get a bang for your buck when you plant from seed, but there's more time that goes into it. You have to baby those seeds before you transplant them. So things to consider about your time, your skills, the space that you have available. Um, so also thinking about space that you have, where are you going to plant your garden? Do you have a small little box in a front yard? Do you have a whole big backyard garden that you can turn the whole thing into? Um, so all that stuff is important to consider. And then also kind of your aesthetic and what you find appealing to look at in your garden. If you don't find your garden to be beautiful, are you going to spend time there? So for me, I like having a pretty wild garden. I do a lot of intermixing of plants. I've often called it kind of like jungle garden where you might see seven different plant types all in one bed. Other people really like clean rows and everything is straight and tidy and there's space between and there's no weeds everywhere. That's fine. 
it doesn't matter to me what you choose to do. I want you all to think about what do you like? What's visually appealing? What matters to you? And then plan your garden to be reflective of that. And like, if you want a weed-free garden, no, you're going to have to spend a little bit more time where I actually don't spend a ton of time weeding in my garden because those weeds, I eat most of them. <laughs> um, they get smothered out by all the other plants that I grow. So I don't have a lot of weed problems, but if you like clean lines and nothing in between rows, you're going to have a lot of weeds and you're going to have to weed that like more than once a week. So just think about that. Um, also things to think about would be like, how are you watering your garden? Do you have a drip irrigation system already there? Do you need to pull out a sprinkler all the way across your yard from your hose bib on your house? Um, again, just something to think about. If you have to pull a hose over with your sprinkler, are you gonna be trampling your really delicate leafy greens on the way over? Um, if you have, let's say, really tall tomato plants and then little things behind it, are those tomato plants gonna block the water? Just think about those types of things when we're planning our garden. Um, another thing, and I've made this mistake in my garden more than once of how do you move materials in and out? If you're doing rows, do you wanna make a wheelbarrow that, do you wanna make them big enough for a wheelbarrow to go through? Um, I built a gate around my old garden and realized very quickly that the wheelbarrow didn't go through the gate. So moving soil in there was not fun. Um, cleaning it up in the in the fall was not fun because I had to carry everything out by hand and then put in my wheelbarrow and then wheel it over to something. I was at a compost pile in that garden and I couldn't load up the wheelbarrow with stuff to deposit into the compost pile. Um, so I think that's important. I know some people have those really awesome um, carts to move stuff around. And then there's the kind of like movable stools that you can lean on or put your knees on to get more support when you're bending down the garden. Make sure if you're, if that's something you use, think about that when you're planning your garden, make sure you give yourself room to get it through a, a gate or get it in between your rows. I think we are ready for the next slide, please. Okay, now we're gonna talk about some microclimate. So these are really fun. Um, this is a way that we can think about expanding our season, growing earlier in the spring and later in the fall. This is also how we can think about taking advantage of the different areas around our own yard. So I wanted to kind of break this into two different sections, like your location microclimates. So what's there that is really hard to change? Um, you might be like in my old house, I was in the shadow of carbonate. I got less than six hours of sunlight in the winter time. And in the summertime, my sun didn't hit my garden until about 10 in the morning. And then by six in the evening, it was gone. So I had a decent window, but not as much as I do now where I get 12 plus hours of sunshine. Um, so those are the type of microclimates that you'll have. You can also think about wind breaks. There's uh, naturally occurring windbreaks like trees, and then there's hardscape windbreaks like your house or like a big cement wall that you have or um, a fence that you have that doesn't let a lot of air flow through like a tall wooden fence. Those all create microclimates too. Ways that you can observe microclimates in your yard are thinking about um, now is a great time as you start to watch the snow melt where does the snow melt first? That's gonna tell you that that's probably your warmest spot, spot and your sunniest spot in your yard. Where does the snow stay until like June? That's gonna be your really cold spot. And neither of those are bad or good. They just tell you what could be planted there. So for instance, in my warm sunny spot where the snow melts first, that's probably gonna be where I plant warm season crops like my tomatoes. The place where my snow melts last, that might be shaded and cooler. And that might actually be a place where I can grow some of those uh, cool tolerant greens like kale and Swiss chard and lettuce and spinach that don't like the heat at all. Um, so I just think, think about that as you're looking at your plan. Um, other things are, we're not going to get deep into soil because I could talk about that for like 20 hours, um, but think about 
do you have a spot that there's a lot of rocks? Are there places that are like always saturated with moisture because it's clay like soil? Um, you can manage and adjust soil, but how do you actually use your existing soil in your garden plan varies. Uh, highly recommend our previous webinar about soil health if you want more info on that. Um, we can also answer questions about it because I I love soil and I, it's really exciting and fun. And there's ways that you can test your soil at home, like put it in a jar and then you put water in it and you shake it up and you let it settle. And then you would see bands of like sand silt and clay, um, rocks too. And that way you can just get a visual clue of what the soil is like. Our county website also has a soil map on it. Um, there's a national map through the USDA, but our county has brought that into their GIS system. So you can see the soil type on your property. Um, my property is split in half. I have prime farmland soil on one half and kind of hydric clay-like soil on the other. So when I'm thinking about my garden plan, I'm taking that into consideration and making some long-term shifts and changes based on that. Um, another thing to talk about is making your own microclimate. So this sounds more complicated, I think, than it really is, but a greenhouse is a microclimate. So if you've got a greenhouse in your yard or you want a greenhouse, you're making your own microclimate. Um, it can be like pictured on here, a big, nice, sturdy greenhouse that is up all year long. Um, the, the picture or the graphic on the right hand side of the screen, that's called like a, a cold frame. So that's just basically like a window pane. Um, that window traps in heat. So that's gonna be able to grow stuff earlier in the spring. There's things like hoop houses, um, frost cloth. I meant to bring my plastic jug in as a prop, but I didn't. Um, milk jugs, you can cut off the bottom of them, put them over a little plant. That's a microclimate that you're creating. Um, you can twist off the lid of that to let moisture out and to kind of cool it off. But that's a really nice way to protect your plants when they're young in the springtime and also make sure they're protected from frost damage. Um, Last year, we had a frost down here in Gannett, I think on June 24th, and I had already planted my tomatoes because why wouldn't I? It's June 24th. Uh, so I was out there with frost cloth and big plastic tote bins and covering up everything. And I had this whole elaborate setup and we, nothing died. We had a little bit of leaf damage on our tallest tomato that was touching the frost cloth. Everything survived. Um, and that's because I created my own microclimate for it. There's also ways to think about, like, uh, those are a lot of ways to make more warmth and protecting from frost. There's also ways to make things cooler because things like lettuces don't like the heat of the sun. So I like to think about trellising and shading out crops. So can you do, maybe you've seen the pictures of like the pretty archways that have squash all over them. They're beautiful. You can also plant leafy greens underneath them to shade out the leafy greens more. Um, so just thinking about creative ways to make microclimates. Some happen in your yard. Or I like doing that too. Um, I think we're ready for the next slide, which is our putting it all together slide. So in my mind, after going over what I just said, I would start by making a list of what I like to eat and how often. And then I would take that list and I would start to look at the different plants that will grow well in our climate and where I can source those from. Once I have that list, that's when I would make a visualization of my garden. You can, and I'll show you shortly what it looks like to do a hand-drawn one. You can find apps. Um, gardenplanner.com, I think is the free app that's a digital version that you can plug in your dimensions and drop stuff into. Google Earth is a really awesome tool. I've used that a lot. Um, it's better for bigger sizes because we don't get a ton of the satellite views. I think the most recent one is 2017 maybe. So it gets blurry when you zoom in too close, but it's a nice way to look at it. And Google Earth has all these fun tools to draw with and make little points with. Um, so if you haven't used Google Earth, um, but you like kind of those apps and kind of the virtual digital options, it's a fun one to use. Um, and you can also just hand draw, like I'll show you shortly, because that's what I've ended up doing most of the time. Um, 
you want that visualization because that's going to really help you spatially see what's going on in your garden. You want to add layers, um, which might be your raised beds and growing spaces. You might put your watering system on there. Maybe you have drip somewhere. Maybe you have overhead sprinkling somewhere. You want to identify existing plants that are already there. Like you have this beautiful big tree in the middle of your yard. That's important to put on your garden plan because it's going to cause shade. There might be watering things related to it. It's going to drop leaves in the fall. So you just want to reflect that. Um, also hard infrastructure like fences, gates, walls, your house, anything like that you might want to include on your map or your visualization. I, you know, my science mind, my, my middle school teacher saying always put a compass and a legend on your map comes into mind. It's important to know your directions in your garden because the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Um, it's pretty noticeable here when it dips down into the southern horizon in the winter time. It's pretty noticeable when all of a sudden it's northeast to northwest in the height of the summer. Um, so all of those, the angle of the sun affects your shady areas and your sunny areas and how much daylight something gets. Um, so with all that, then you actually start to sketch out where you're planting what. Um, I like to make kind of like a task list as I'm saying that. So I might say, okay, I want to plant peas in garden bed J. And then on, on my task list, I might write seed peas and put some dates on there. Or maybe I need to order the pea seeds first. Um, so you can just create those task lists for yourself. Um, and then I really think it's important to set up uh, some type of system for taking notes. It could be like a journal. It could be a notepad on your phone. It could be a whiteboard that you keep. Um, anything that works for you that's accessible just to write down little things like hail on June 18th, frost on June 24th. Like I mentioned earlier, first ripe tomato on July 18th. Um, as you start to garden year after year, it's nice to kind of um, look back over the seasons and see, oh, are things shifting or changing? Oh, did I have a really bad harvest last year, but this year it's great? Did I do something different? Was it a different plant variety? Was the weather just different? Um, what was it, right? So by recording and keeping notes, we have some of those reference points so we can start to see patterns in our garden. Um, always like to tell people that gardening is a learning process. You will have failures every single year. Something will not grow. You'll have a pest. Your tomatoes might be mushy. Um, hail might come and knock everything out. All of those things happen. It's not a reflection of your skills, your ability, or the world telling you not to garden. It's just gardening is in the hands of nature and we are along for the ride. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say about putting it together. Our next slide, I'm going to share with you me putting it together. So I did this lovely little sketch. I am not an artist by any means. So nothing is to scale. No lines are straight, but it works. It tells me what I need to know. So I'll kind of just walk you through my sketch so you can see my lovely um, compass in the top right corner. So the orientation is east to west on these garden beds. These were existing beds that I'm working with when I bought my house, which is a blessing and a curse in ways. It's already there, which is lovely, but it's not exactly how I would have done it. The garden beds are a little bit bigger. I'm short, I'm five two. I can't reach the middle of my garden beds. Things that you think about, right? Um, you'll also notice on the top of the thing, I have a windbreak. And I wrote, my handwriting is not great, but it says shades one to three first. So I've named my garden beds one through eight. One, two, and three get shade way earlier than six, seven, and eight. So when I'm thinking about that, I'm saying, okay, well, if one, two, and three get shade earlier, I'm going to plant cooler season crops back there because they're going to be shaded from the sun versus seven, eight, or six, seven, and eight. I'm going to do warmer season crops. Um, I also, uh, wrote down, so I did garden in this garden last year. It's important to rotate your crops. I wrote down what I grew last year with the associated number. So you can see like last year, I, my tomatoes were in garden bed six. 
So I do not want tomatoes there this year. I moved them to four. Um, I also like garlic for anyone who doesn't know, garlic is a plant that you plant in the fall. It stays in the garden bed over winter. You harvest it in kind of the late summer, August-ish, um, maybe September, depending on. So garden bed eight is filled with garlic. I can barely plant anything, but I'm going to get creative and try a couple things interplanted or as soon as the garlic pulls up might plant a couple more things in there. It's a test. I have no idea if it's gonna work or not. Um, you can also see my garden bed five is all raspberries. I personally would never have planted raspberries in a raised bed. The original owner of the home did, so I'm working with it until I can transplant them out and then have another garden bed to work with. Um, my center circle is an herb bed. It's beautiful and it has all my herbs. I don't know what's going to make it over this winter. I last year planted chives, oregano, sage, parsley, and thyme in there. I'm hoping they all come up again. We will see. I might plant more in there or I might say, oh, this didn't work for my time. Can I find a different location for it? We'll see. We don't know. Um, that's the beauty of gardening is you never know what's going to happen when spring comes and the snow melts. Um, so going back to kind of the garden plant, so you can see that I wrote at the top what we eat. These are veggies that we eat pretty consistently in the summertime. Carrots, radishes, turnips, peas and beans, lettuce, kale, Swiss chard, cucumbers, zucchini, tomatoes, and corn. That's a lot of things. When I wrote that, I was like, oh, what about onions? Oh, what about potatoes? I buy a lot of those from farmers because they can grow them a lot better than I can in bigger quantities. Um, so this is where I'm start. This is what I'm working with this year. I also wrote down whether those plants were cool season crops or warm season crops, because that's helping me plot it out. Um, I also wrote just from my own point of view, what type of crop they were, because I like to do a lot of interplanting. So I might plant a root crop next to a leafy crop because the root crop grows more in the soil. The leafy crop goes up higher. So those can go really closely next to each other. Um, one thing that I did not put on this sketch that I think would have been helpful is whether I'm going to direct seed the crop or transplant the crop. So you could easily do that by writing DS or T next to the line on there. Um, I didn't do that. I wish I would have, but I already took this picture and put the slide together. <laughs> so it's not on there. Um, most of these would be direct seeded, pretty much everything except for tomatoes and potentially my kale and chard might be transplants. Um, so now I'll kind of walk you through just garden bed one. Garden bed one and two are pretty close to each other. So I'm going to start on the right side where it says peas. So that's kind of my north side of my garden bed. And I'm going to do tall pea trellis. Next to that, I'm going to do a row of lettuce and then a row of carrots. And I'm going to stop there and I'm going to wait two weeks. And then I'm going to plant another row of carrots and another row of lettuce. That way I'm staggering them out and I'm not getting 25 heads of lettuce in the same week but I can break it up a little bit so I can harvest a head of lettuce hopefully every day. Um, I also, cause this is the south side where you see it says June, that's a row of cucumbers. Those will also be trellis that might provide a little bit of shade for my carrots and lettuce to get them to grow a little bit longer. Um, garden bed, I think three is an interesting one. So I like to grow kale and chard kind of mixed in with each other. Those are my two leafy greens that I eat all the time. I don't eat a lot of spinach. Um, it just is what it is. That's my preference. So that bed is going to be primarily kale and chard. And I like to grow the big plants and get big leaves from it. So what can I grow in there while those are maturing that I can harvest quickly? So radishes and salad turnips grow like within three weeks. So I'm going to interplant radishes and turnips in with a kale and chard and harvest them before they get really big. So that's going to be a very mixed bed. Kale, radishes, and turnips are all in the same family. So they can maintain the same bed together, but then I wouldn't plant those in that bed next season. Um, let's talk about bed number four. 
tomatoes. I love tomatoes. We grow a lot of tomatoes. It's not just a bed of tomatoes. I grow companion plants with my tomatoes. So in that parentheses, if you can read it, which is pretty hard to read, sorry. Um, the benefit of doing a digital version is you don't have to deal with your bad handwriting if your handwriting's bad like mine. Um, I grow dill, basil, nasturtiums, and marigolds in with my tomatoes. It brings pollinators. Those things taste yummy together. It creates some color in there. Um, it helps to smother out the weeds around the tomatoes because some of those like nasturtiums are kind of trellis, uh, not trellising, they're kind of viney and bushy on the ground. So they smother out a lot of weeds. I also think nasturtiums taste delicious. Um, they're kind of spicy and yummy. So that's, that's what I'm going to do for bed four. Bed six, I think is the last one I'll talk about. And that's going to be my three sisters garden. Um, so for those who don't know, Three Sisters is a style of gardening that's rooted in the indigenous peoples of Central and South America, um, Mexico as well. And, and all, let's just say all of, um, all of the Americas and indigenous folks because it was brought throughout um, the Northeast, Southwest, every, everyone did it because it's a really great practice where you're incorporating corn, essentially corns, beans, and squash. The corn grows up high, the beans trellis it, the squash is a ground cover, beans fix nitrogen. Um, so it feeds the corn and the squash and it's just this beautiful um, inner mix of plants that taste really good together. So I'm going to grow that in um, garden bed six. I think a couple other, I'm looking at my notes on the side of my, um, see if, oh yeah. So this is not to scale. I did not measure anything. I did not um, say each of these garden beds is six by six. Uh, you could do that if you wanted to. I've been gardening long enough now where I just kind of wing it and I don't say, oh, I need 24 tomato plants to plant in this bed. I just kind of feel it out. Um, if this is your first year, first couple years gardening, or you're very, um, analytical in that way where you want to think about, oh, a tomato plant needs 24 inch square inches. My bed has room for seven tomato plants. You can do that. I didn't hear. It's definitely something you can do. Um, those kind of app planners help with that a little bit more because they're kind of derived for squares. I don't necessarily like things in squares and rows. So I'm I like everything mixed together. So that's just my preference. Um, what's your preference would be the question and how do you plan your garden based on your preferences? And hopefully what we talked about today helps to guide you in deciding that. So I think with that, we're ready to go on to questions. Um, Hannah, if you could go to the slide with our survey link really quick, because if people have to jump off before questions or they're not, they don't wanna stay around for questions, I would love it if you all could take the survey, let us know how we did today. Um, feedback really helps us do better in the future, understand what worked well for you, what didn't, maybe what we missed that you would like to hear more of. So if you can and want to, please take the survey. It would mean a lot to us. We'll also send a link um, to you all that registered with the slides and the recording early next week. Um, okay, now we can do questions and we can uh, stop sharing the screen if people want to come off mute and ask questions or have a discussion. Um, oh, Lily. Okay, so I have a specific chat directly to me. Why don't my radishes grow anything but greens? nitrogen issue. Uh, I would have to do a little bit re of research before I could answer that fully confident that I could say it was nitrogen might be phosphorus. Um, let me do some research on that, Lily, and I can get back to you because I'm not 100% sure. Kind of surprised my thought could also be like a nematode or some type of soil dwelling bug that was nibbling off the root, um, not letting it form a bulb. We have some things here that could do that in the soil. So I, I will uh, do a little bit more research though and let you know if I come up with anything. 
Let's see. Someone said, I grow tomatoes in the same bed each year because it has a plastic cover to protect early and late season. Is this a problem? If it works for you, it's not a problem. If you've been doing it successfully without issues, I would say keep doing it. I think the things that you can consider are that um, tomatoes are heavy feeders. So you're going to, and you might maybe already do add nutrients back into that bed. Maybe you compost it. Maybe you do a lot of fish emulsion. Um, maybe you do worm castings. Those can all boost the nutrients in there. Maybe you do fall cover crops of nitrogen fixing species to make that ready for tomato planting. Um, Outside of the fertility of the soil, the other concern that people have when you leave the same plant in the same bed year after year is pests. So if we think about like pests will come back to a place over and over again because they're in anticipating that food source to be there. When we rotate, we kind of trick the pest into not thinking that no longer having that plant there where they thought it was going to be. So then they kind of give up and move along. So if you plant tomatoes year after year in the same place, you might notice hornworms start to appear or another pest um, that likes tomatoes might show up. So you might have to trick them by moving the tomatoes. That is one of the reasons that um, in my drawing, I said I do dill, basil, marigolds, and nasturtiums. Marigolds specifically have been proven scientifically to um, deter some of those pests. So if you're going to leave your tomatoes in the same bed, can you add in other plants in that bed that help to deter those pests? Um, I don't know. I would say, I guess, hornworms, tomato hornworms, those are those big juicy caterpillars. Um, birds probably eat them. So are there ways that you can invite birds into your garden? That's, that gets tricky if you're growing other things that you don't want your birds eating, like berries, um, I know like Robins just love my strawberries every year. So that frustrates me. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think though that um, if, it's, if it's working for you, it's working for you and don't change things that are working for you. But no, if one season it's not working for you, you could think about the fertility of the soil or potential pests that are causing problems and then switch it up. Um, powdery mildew, is something that people that grow tomatoes have to think about. We don't get it here that often because it's so dry here, um, but it, it could end up being a problem. Um, and, and same thing with blight. That's another thing that people that grow tomatoes can experience. I haven't experienced them personally, so I can't tell you how to manage them. Um, both blight and powdery mildew are very common though. So if you were just to, if you started to see that show up, Google would probably give you some good ways to manage for it. Um, hopefully that addresses your question, Richard. Um, okay, let's see, other questions. I usually feed with compost and manure. Yep, good. I'm glad it's not a problem. Maybe I'll try it because it's way less work to keep, to keep them in the same bed, especially if you have protection on them. What's the best way to get rid of or minimize aphids naturally? Oh man. Um, spraying them off with water, um, even kind of dunking your plant in water is a natural way that people manage for aphids. Um, I'm going to kind of put my ecology hat on here and say that ants, ants and aphids have a very interesting relationship. If you have ants in your yard, they can immobilize aphids. Um, they milk them and feed off of them and the ants live happily ever after and the aphids don't move around. Um, another thing, which is a technique I like to use is what I consider trap cropping. So if I see, and I've done it with, gosh, alfalfa, clover, and dill. And if I see an aphid population on those plants, I will leave them there because that's serving as a host for the aphids and they're not going to my other crops. Um, another thing to think about is soil health. Um, soil health is directly related to plant health. So there are some people in the agronomy, um, agricultural world that talk about the health of the plant will make it so that pests do not bother it. So if your plant is healthy enough, it should not be bothered by aphids. And like, that is a very concrete statement. It has to do with the way that the, um, biology of the aphid works and the food sources that it can break down 
And if the plant is healthy enough and healthy is kind of an arbitrary arbitrary word, but it's based on like the sugar content or the complex carbohydrate content of the plants. Um, if it has enough complex carbohydrates, the aphids cannot feed on it. They will leave it alone. Um, while that's not an easy answer for you, I think it gives you maybe a little bit to consider. Um, immediate thing, if you have aphids on a plant that are in the aphids are hurting the plant, spray it with water over and over again. You can use things like neem oil. I avoid neem oil. I avoid all of those kind of, um, you know, pesticides are anything that kills pests. So neem oil is technically a pesticide, but pesticides kill other things that are beneficial. Um, ladybugs eat aphids. That's another thing. You can think about some of those uh, beneficial insects. Um, hopefully that's enough of an answer to get you thinking of some of those opportunities there. Oh, what is the approximate size of my garden beds? Uh, they're all the same size. I think, I gosh, I measured them last year. What are they? So, would it be four by four? Would I be too short to reach into a four by four bed? <laughs> Sorry, Carol, I will uh, measure as soon as spring comes and let you know. Um, which works, but almost too wide to reach from side to side. Yeah, I, I think the rule of thumb for most people would be like a 30 inch row from one side. So you could do technically 60 inches wide if you could access from either side. I think that's a rule of thumb that a lot of farmers use when they're doing market gardening. Um, Let's see, my cat poops in the tomato bed in winter. Now a short trip as he is ancient. How do I deal with treat? Oh, who Willie, that's a really tough one. Um, you have to think about the food that your cat eats and the medications your cat is on. Those will determine how to manage that. Um, in general, I would say that you would dig up that soil and replace it is your safest bet. There are pathogens that cat poop can transmit to humans. Um, so I'd be very weary to say, don't worry about it at all. Um, healthy soil should be able to break those down. I don't know. I would, um, if your cat is on a lot of different medications and it eats, you know, conventional food per se, I would probably dig it up and switch out that soil, unfortunately. If you really don't want to do that and your cat's not on any medications and it eats a really lovely organic raw diet, maybe you get eye to hound food for it or something, um, you could do some things that would feed the soil and activate the soil biology. Um, soil biology likes sugars. So you could maybe do a molasses and fish emulsion or worm casting and diluted milk. Um, and that would kind of get the biology activated in the springtime and maybe it would be able to eat away whatever pathogens or bacteria is contained in the cat poop. Um, but once again, I'm not gonna tell you what's safe or not safe because you would need to um, do some soil testing and probably talk to someone with a deeper knowledge of cat diseases than I have. Um, okay, good. I'm glad you like my response. I would love to know how that goes. And if you have the interest, like maybe do a soil test and just see what's before and what's after when you do that method. Um, Cause I think it's interesting. And I think I know there's a cat in my neighborhood that tries to get in my garden. So I think it's something that we all have to kind of think about, even if we don't have our own cat, but uh, the neighborhood cats that like to come in our spaces. Um, so it's first just step. about four o'clock. And I think we have one question left. I don't know if we have time for that question. Amy, what do you think? I think we should answer it because it's one of great. my favorite conversations. It's a great have. question. Uh, Thank and you, Sarah. Sarah is actually someone I know from Michigan who asked me if this would be, I was in Michigan nine years ago before moving to Idaho, if she should join. And I said, yeah, come on in anyways. Um, so the first step for turning your chemically fertilized lawn into healthy, alive soil. Stop using chemicals on your lawn. Step one. Step two would be adding in biologics like 
organic nutrients. So replacing synthetic fertilizers with fish emulsion or worm castings, um, manure, compost, compost tea, any of those things. Because if you just cut off the chemical, chemical treatments and don't do anything, your lawn's probably going to die. Um, so that's going to be step one is finding key replacements. If you have a landscaping company, you can ask them questions of what do you do to manage a lawn organically? Can you shift my lawn organic? Um, that would be definitely something to consider. Um, the other things for healthy, alive soil. So without getting way in depth about soil, because like I said, I could talk about it for hours. So soil health is rooted, um, and a few different concepts, limited disturbance, like chemical use is one of them. The other is that the soil is alive and it needs to be fed. So we feed our soil essentially with roots. Um, so when we cut our lawn, it sheds the roots and feeds the soil. With that said, we don't wanna cut the lawn too short. So if you can cut the lawn no shorter than three inches, um, you're going to be, feeding that soil biology underneath the grass. If you can incorporate more diversity of plants, um, whether they're grasses or not, um, if you can like seed some clover, um, let dandelions live there, all of those different, like the diverse plant populations will feed your soil biology. So allow those other things to grow or plant other things. Um, trying to like put my Michigan hat back on because watering probably isn't a problem for you. Um, municipal water can carry, like if you were watering from city water and it had chlorine in it, chlorine does like, it's good for water because it's killing um, potential pathogens that hurt humans, but it will also hurt biology in the soil. Um, so can you let water evaporate off the chlorine? It takes about 24 hours and then water it. Can you catch water and use that instead. Um, so some of that is something to think about. And then let me think if I'm missing anything from that conversation, <laughs> healthy soil, um, feed it with good stuff, plant diversity, minimize disturbance, and try to keep living roots in the ground as long as you can. Um, people oftentimes are like, I want to replace my lawn and I want to do a pollinator habitat and they dig up all their lawn and it's bare soil. And then they're like, all oh, these weeds came up. <laughs> weeds are indicators. Weeds are there to protect the soil, to keep it thriving. Um, so don't be afraid of them. Just continue to build the soil biology, continue to feed it, continue to seed the plants that you want. And eventually those weeds will be reduced. Uh, hopefully that answers that question. Um, I know we're over time. I don't know if anyone else has any questions or ideas or things they want to show, uh, throw out there. Um, it was really fun to chat with you all. I appreciate the questions. They were great ones. And um, if you can take the survey, like I said, we will share slides, recording and survey links to everyone who registered for this. Hannah, do you want to just throw the slides back up and go to the save the date really quick? Um, because Absolutely. we have, awesome, thank you. We have a couple of fun things coming in the future. Um, Hannah's going to work on this slide, but I will talk about them quickly first while she's getting the slide pulled up. So Haley Public Library is amazing. They have great resources. And every year, uh, Mano and I, some of you may know Mano. she runs the Wood River Seed Library. She's a master gardener, amazing resource in our community. We co-host a webinar series with the Haley Public Library. Our first one is March 10th. We'll talk about seeds, so starting seeds, and then soil, so making sure your garden is ready to grow in. April 14th will be our cool season gardening, so we'll talk about all those plants that like the colder weather. May 12th, we'll talk about warm season gardening. So you'll be ready to um, think about tomatoes, peppers, corn, zucchini, all those delicious things that we love. And then um, I know I mentioned it earlier, but just wanted to add it again, that our seed and plant exchanges that happen at the upper Big Wood River Grange in Haley will be happening on April 23rd, that's connected with the Earth Week celebration. And then May 28th, which is Memorial Day weekend, um, Seeds are free, some plant starts are free, people bring seed, people bring plant starts, they bring cuttings. 
we'll have some farmers selling starts as well. And then the Wood River Seed Library has the entire assortment of seeds that are shared by volunteer gardeners in our community and redistributed out. So it's an awesome way to connect with other gardeners, get your hands on some seeds and plant material, um, chat about the amazing spring we're having and the lack of drought, hopefully, that we're having this year. So um, with that, I think we are completed with our webinar today. Um, any last questions? I don't see anything else in the chat. So I think we are good to go.